Mark Twain once said, all you need in life is ignorance and confidence, and then success is sure. Well, that's not altogether true, but his premise is on track. Whether we fail or succeed can sometimes depend on our own tenacity and on the confidence with which we approach a task. We've all heard stories of people who beat the odds and achieved where others tried and failed. But we seldom stop to think about the many times those same people fell flat on their faces before realizing their goals. Thomas Edison reportedly built and tested more than a thousand different light bulbs before finally getting one to work. How many of us, I wonder, would have continued the quest after so many disappointments? The late Colonel Sanders took his chicken recipe to more than a thousand different restaurants before finally convincing one that it was finger licking good. And consider Abraham Lincoln. For 28 years, he couldn't seem to do anything right. He lost several jobs, he failed in business, he endured numerous losses while running for public office, and eventually suffered a nervous breakdown. But he refused to give up. Finally, he won the election that made him one of the greatest presidents in the history of the United States. Time and again, we look into the lives of people who succeed, and we find a string of failures and disappointments. That's a vitally important understanding for us all, but especially for young people just starting out in life. To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org. Millions of moms and dads can agree that being a parent is one of life's greatest joys. However, there are countless couples who aren't able to experience that happiness due to infertility or miscarriage. Today on Family Talk, you're going to hear more from three women who suffered through the very pain I just described. Their names are Lynn Binky, Leslie Snodgrass, and Janet Malcolm. Together, they started an organization called Stepping Stones that ministers to and supports wounded families. Their ministry is now part of Bethany Christian Services, which continues that work even today. I don't want to take anything away from their story, so let's be sure to dive back into this right now. As we get started, Lynn Binky addresses the tough decision that those dealing with infertility or miscarriages must face. How long should couples seek out additional medical treatments before deciding to stop trying to have a baby? It's one of the questions that is asked, and here are her thoughts on this edition of Family Talk. I never even had a laparoscopy. My husband suddenly felt that he didn't want to feel that he had in any way demanded a baby of God if that wasn't God's best plan for us. So once we had found out that he had some sperm, although it was low, and that I ovulated sometimes and had one good tube, even though that didn't make for very high percentages, the door was open and God could put everything together if he chose to, and we were comfortable just to leave it in his hands at that point. But yeah. Lynn, <laughs> Let me ask you on his behalf if that differs from any other medical intervention. Uh, if the Lord wants to take me home right now, he can. It may be that my physicians can postpone my death for 10 years. So in a way, we are kind of overriding what would have occurred if just left uh, to uh, the Lord's timing, I suppose. Uh, could you not make that case in any area? Yes, and when I wrote an article that, that talked about our decision, I got a lot of letters from people who said, they hey, if you had cancer, you'd go to the doctor and do everything yeah. you possibly could. But I also had a local pastor's wife who'd been taking her temperature for 18 years and hadn't gotten pregnant. Who read years. It, you can go on. Read sure. the article and said, this is an answer. I'm free to stop. I don't have to do anymore. And after that, she got pregnant. Is that right? It's, it's different for everyone because I honestly believe that the Lord was leading me to have these surgeries that, to work with the mm -hmm. doctors. There was a point when um, I had had a laparoscopy and they said, we need to go in and do another major surgery. And I asked him how long I could wait. He said three months on, at the most. I believed with all my heart that the Lord was going to allow me to conceive in that time. He did not. So I went ahead with the other surgery. You know, I could have sat back and said, but Lynn got pregnant. She didn't even have to do anything, you know, and here, mm -hmm. do I have to do this again? But I think it's just how the Lord works differently with each mm -hmm. individual. You said earlier that you sat in your doctor's office every month and wept. 
Is that right? Yes. And bless his heart, he would put his arm around me and say, Leslie, it'll happen, it'll happen. He was a great encouragement to me. He was a Christian. He, uh-huh. And I think that's important. To me, the emotional support was as important to me as the physical advice. Yeah. But it was exciting um, for him to be able to share in the joy that Dave and I felt at the birth of our daughter after four years of infertility and a miscarriage, Ah. you know, he was just as thrilled as we were. Leslie, that takes us to the good news that you do have a child. I have two now. You have two. Mm -hmm. And tell me how that happened. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> it just, um, they never did. Was it did. solved medically? Or no, did it we just never occur? did find an actual physical reason. I had ovulatory problems, and David did have a low sperm count with low mobility. So I think it was just a combination of things and just at the wrong time. I don't know. Um, Brianna is four now, and Aaron came along nine while well, I got pregnant while well, Bree was nine months old. And so they're both just miracle babies to me. But you still have not forgotten, have oh, you? Oh, I just, to me, it has been resolved because I can look at my children and, and praise the Lord for them, but I will never, ever forget those monthly visits. Yeah. And I praise God for that, too, because when I see my sister in the hallway crying because Mother's Day at church was so difficult, I can put my arms around her and she can know that I do She's understand. going through the same thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, Leslie, we have not revealed till this moment that uh, you are a mother, that you have the two children, simply because you all told me in my office before the program started that the moment an infertile woman especially, but an infertile couple, find out that you have children they don't identify with you quite in the same way. You're one of that other group that change some camps. of them resent. You change camps. Mm-hmm. I can remember um, in the first year that Stepping Stones was around, um, a friend called and said, I finally have gotten to the point where I realize I need to share my concerns and my frustrations with my infertility. Can you meet me for lunch? Well, at that time, I was about four or five months pregnant, and I knew if I met her, she would see this, and I wanted to be honest because that was something I felt was important as an infertile, that people be honest with me. I I shared with her, I said, well, I will be glad to do that, but I want you to know now that I am expecting. And she said, I'm sorry, I cannot meet with you then. And my heart just cried out to say, but I do know, I've been through all the tests, I understand, but I had to let her go. I had to get let her get to the point where she could accept that. Yeah. She wasn't going to receive anything that I had to say with that barrier between them. I don't think that is always the case, but yes. a lot of times we're sensitive to that. And It's just hard to overestimate the degree of frustration that a woman feels in that situation. Lynn, you also have become a mother. Tell us about that. Um, after we decided to stop infertility treatment, I immediately became pregnant. And then I had a miscarriage. And we had to wait three months before we tried again. And then I got pregnant again. And now we have a precious two and a half year old. Hmm. And I don't think I'll ever be able to take her for granted. Hmm. But I am a normal enough mother that I was not unhappy to be able to get away for these few days. To come to <laughs> you know, and that's something that I might mention that sometimes having been infertile, having prayed for these children, having had other people pray for these children, they don't want us to have the normal frustrations of mothers. And uh-huh. we're expected to really be super moms. And we're not. We are just yeah. as human as all those other you mothers. You cried till you got him and now you don't <laughs> no, want him. No. <laughs> that's that been hurled at you? <laughs> A number of times. Uh-huh. Janet, you have not been able to produce your own no. child, but you have two wonderful adopted children. Yes, Tell me do. about that. Adoption was almost as difficult for us as infertility, mm-hmm. I think. We lost 10 before we ten. finally, 10 times that we thought we were going to get one. The hardest one that we lost, we'd worked with a girl for about six months, and her baby was born on April the 2nd, 1981, and the, we were leaving to go to the hospital to pick him up, and they called and said that she had changed her mind. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, we were crushed. The next year, um, I dreaded for April the 2nd because I... I knew that it would bring back all of the memories. April the 2nd, 1982, we got a call that said we have a baby, and it was out here in California. And we were just, you know, I was just overjoyed. Lord, you took one away from us last year, but, you know, only by your grace and love would you give us another one on April the 2nd. That one also fell through. 
at that time, I think I hit rock bottom, and I was yeah. finally able to look up and say, if not a mother, then what? And I was ready to move out into any direction he wanted. But finally, in August of 82, we got a call. I'm not going to be able to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Still <laughs> there. <take> it? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a wonderful okay. story. <laughs> okay. In August of 1982, we got the call that we had waited years for. And they said, we have a little boy that's 16 months old that needs a mom and dad. And they brought him to us the next day, and they brought him out to our church, which was real special. We met them out there. And this little tiger came running through the doors of the church and ran right past me. And I went and picked him up, and I said, are you going to let me be your mama? And it was just love at first sight. But I said, when's his birthday? And they said he was born April the 2nd, 1981. Is that right? And I said, get me a chair. (laughs) My legs were just shaking, and I was just... At first, I thought it was the same little boy, and it had just taken 16 months for us to get him, but it was not the same mother. We had Tim a month when we found out that his birth mother was pregnant again. Uh, Her first choice was uh, abortion, and our lawyer said, if you carry the baby, I'm sure Janet and Barry would love to have a brother or sister for Tim, so she agreed to this. And Courtney was born on April the 2nd, 1983. (laughs) That's the Lord's answer, isn't it? (laughs) And, you know, it was just two years apart. You know, I think he took two away from us that just devastated us. And he gave us two back. So we celebrate April the 2nd in a mighty big way. we cry every time we hear that story. You do. Lynn, you're crying. (laughs) This is Janet's baby, and you're crying. When Tim came to Janet, the, the vacation Bible school um, thank you dinner or whatever just was turned into an impromptu baby shower that the church the was involved church. in. And there was not a dry eye any place. We cried the whole night oh. and had a wonderful time. I remember Janet saying, what does a 16-month-old eat trying to go through the line and fill <laughs> We expected a baby. You know, we expected a, we had always expected a baby. We had a crib and baby clothes, not... <laughs> instant toddlerhood. Oh, yeah. instant discipline. Our minister it said she got her baby that hit the ground running. Yeah. And <laughs> does that. Special. Well, our time is gone. You are special people, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your sharing your stories. I tell you what, on April 2nd of next year, we're going to be thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> April 2nd, it's very a very special day. day. <laughs> You're going to have one best birthday party next year. And uh, to all of you, I congratulate you. To those who are listening to us who don't yet have reason for uh, celebration and congratulation, our heart goes out to you, mm-hmm. our prayers go yes, to you. Does, yeah. And um, what else can you say but put your hand in the hand of the Lord, regardless mm-hmm. of the outcome? There's so many areas of life where we have to do that, Mm -hmm. and this is obviously one of them. Friends, thanks for being with us these days. Thanks for having us. And it's a real pleasure, and maybe someplace, sometime, we can do it again. Great, great. You're listening to Family Talk, a radio broadcast of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the Institute, and we've come to the midpoint of today's broadcast. On behalf of Dr. Dobson and all of us here at JDFI, I want to thank you for listening today and, by the way, for your continued support. We're completely supported by you, our faithful listeners. We would not be able to bring programs to you like the one you're listening to today without your generous contributions. Learn how you can stand with us by visiting drjamesdobson.org. Let's get back to today's broadcast right now here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We have uh, invited my very good friend, Dr. Roy Stringfellow, uh, to come and be with us and bring us up to date on some of the uh, medical information that's very relevant to what we've been talking about today. Uh, Dr. Stringfellow is an OBGYN. He's a Family Talk board member. Roy, it is good to have you here in the studio today. Well, thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. Well, we've been talking about uh, women who are suffering, women who are hurting over the loss of a child or the inability to get pregnant, and husbands too. You have been through it as well with your children. Uh, you, you've got a son and a daughter, and the son's wife uh, lost uh, a baby. 
and your daughter lost one, right? Right. My daughter uh, has had one miscarriage, and, and my, my son is, uh, and his wife have had two miscarriages. The first one, uh, my daughter and her husband had come to Conroe Springs to tell us about the pregnancy, and they were just elated. Uh, and they were early on, and while they were here, she began to bleed. She just uh, was in tears and said, Dad, I don't have a doctor yet. Would you be my doctor? You had to deliver your own deceased grandbaby. Yeah, we had to, we had to follow through with that. And uh, we got an ultrasound, and it was clear that it was a non-viable pregnancy. And uh, uh, serendipitously, our son and his wife were here also, and we actually had a funeral service in the backyard, and it was a very touching, special mm-hmm. time with uh, Bible verses, and, uh-huh. and uh, it, was, it was hard, but uh, that, that helped to be able to say goodbye. And that's something that I would recommend to many of the listeners. Uh, if there is a miscarriage, very often it results in a DNC, which means there's really not you know, a fetus that you can deal with that way, but to take something that's a token uh, of that little baby, like when my son and, and his wife had their uh, first miscarriage. We were on a family vacation in Mexico. Uh, they had miscarried about a week earlier, and we uh, blocked out a very special time and met down on the uh, the beach uh, on the Sea of Cortez and, and had a prayer service with special Bible verses they'd picked out. And uh, mm. uh, they had a, a beautiful flower that they threw into the water. Mm. And uh, that is still very, very tender for you, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. But it was very, uh, it was very special and a good time. Give us the statistics. Uh, what percentage of pregnancies end in miscarriage? Well, I, I, I think it's increasing because we can detect pregnancy now when we couldn't before. Uh, when I was uh, a resident, uh, the miscarriage rate that we quoted was twenty percent, which is fairly high, ten to twenty percent. But now that uh, we have very sensitive ways of detecting pregnancy early, we know that a very large number of pregnancies will miscarry early on, and the lady won't actually recognize it as a miscarriage. Uh, The amount of bleeding may be even less than for a normal period, uh, and it may be timed when a period was supposed to happen. And in reality, uh, the miscarriage rate is between 30 and 50 percent instead of the 20 percent we used to think so of. So that 20 percent is a lower bound estimate than the That's right. true number is, That's is right. higher. How about infertility? Yeah, in, infertility is a, a relatively common thing, but uh, I think the statistics read that uh, uh, if a couple is actively trying for a pregnancy for one year, uh, if you take 100 of those uh, couples at 85 uh, of them, in other words, 85% will become pregnant within the first year. If they uh, continue to try for another year, uh, then by the time that second year is over, 95% of the couples have conceived. Uh, so it's a fairly common thing, but again, persistence pays off. If a, a couple is trying to get pregnant and is having difficulty, uh, where along that timeline should the woman go see her doctor? Uh, Yeah, that's a very good question. And basically what we tell our patients is if they're uh, in the the normal childbearing uh, range uh, and they've been a year of unprotected intercourse, then it's time to go see a physician. Mm -hmm. If a lady is over 30 years of age, she may want to try it a little sooner because the ability to get pregnant declines with increasing age. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to wait till you're 35 or 36 and then see a doctor in That way you've entered a time which can be very difficult anyhow. Is what I have read and heard accurate that uh, uh, previous uh, abortions and STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, play a role in the incidence of infertility? Well, they do, and and especially uh, pelvic (laughs) infections. uh, And it can be very subtle. A lady can have uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia and it can affect the fallopian tubes, and she may or may not even be aware that she's had an infection, uh, but then later has difficulty becoming pregnant, so we mm-hmm. need to, uh, to be very careful about that. Uh, how about the uh, role of the husband in uh, infertility? Uh, how common is that, and what are the causes? 
women are very complex. Men are a lot simpler. <laughs> and so the workup for men is, is getting a semen analysis, a sperm count. Yeah. And usually you can detect if there's a problem. About a third of uh, patients that experience infertility is due to the male factor, problems with the sperm count. About a third of the time, it's due to problems with the lady, and about a third of the time, it's a combination of the two. Mm. And with the women, it's very complex. It can be a, a failure to ovulate properly. It can be a, a hostility of the cervical mucus to the sperm, which uh, prevents uh, pregnancy. There can be an abnormality of the uterus, such as fibroids or polyps that might uh, uh, be a problem. Uh, it can be a tubal infection. Uh, it can be an ovulation. Uh, ladies with a polycystic ovary syndrome have a much uh, higher rate of infertility. So there's a lot of things that need to be thought about. And that's one other thing that you talked to me about when somebody should be evaluated. Yeah. If they clearly have a history of a problem, say if someone has had a major tubal infection or if somebody has a very large fibroid uterus or if um, uh, they have polycystic ovaries, then they probably should be evaluated a lot sooner. Hmm. You and I were talking um, before that uh, my wife Shirley was unable to have a second pregnancy. We had Danae and then uh, she was not able to uh, to get pregnant again and they gave her something called clomiphene which I understand is now called clomid and that is the um, uh, ovarian stimulation uh, drug. Is that an accurate description? That's right. It's a drug that uh, stimulates the ovary to ovulate. Now, it's only effective for infertile women who are not ovulating should not be used uh, for women who are ovulatory and have other problems, Yeah, obviously. Are there any treatments that Christians ought to be aware of or and wary of? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, morality enters into the picture because uh, very often uh, ladies that want to do in vitro fertilization will undergo uh, stimulation of the ovary and they'll collect multiple eggs and then they yeah. can be fertilized, and it may result in uh, a cluster of uh, fertilized eggs. And what do you do with the ones that are not utilized? That's, a, that's certainly a moral concern. I think uh, most uh, serious Christians consider the union of the sperm and the egg is uh, initiation of human life. Life so begins at conception. That's exactly right. Well, Dr. Stringfellow, thank you for coming by and talking to us about these uh, issues. We could do three or four programs right here uh, because there's so many issues that I think uh, women and, and men, too, would like to hear. Um, but at least we've made a step in that direction. It's been a fascinating uh, discussion about a very interesting and touching subject, a very important subject. Well, that's certainly a moving discussion about the emotional whirlwind of infertility and its devastating impact on a marriage. Today here on Family Talk, you've been listening to a classic conversation Dr. Dobson had with Lynn Binky, Leslie Snodgrass, and Janet Malcolm. Also, Dr. Roy Stringfellow, a certified OBGYN, also weighed in on the second part of this conversation as well. Be sure to visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org for additional resources that will minister to those wrestling with this hurt and this pain. That's drjamesdobson.org, and then go to the Broadcast tab. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton here for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. You know, the news comes in all kinds of shapes, sizes, and formats these days. But how do you cut through the noise and get to the heart of the matters that affect your family? Come to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk and sign up for Dr. Dobson's monthly newsletter. You'll find clarity on tough issues, encouragement for your everyday life, and trusted principles to help you build strong, healthy, connected families. Go to drjamesdobson.org. Sign up today. That's drjamesdobson.org. In marriage as in courtship, there's a simple rule of thumb for intimacy. Take your time. Dr. James Dobson. 
or family talk. Some interesting research has been done recently on the emotional bonding between husbands and wives. According to Dr. Donald Joy, a couple bonds most closely when they move slowly and systematically through the various stages of intimacy during their courtship and early marriage. When later stages are reached prematurely, such as when couples kiss passionately on the first date or have sexual intercourse shortly thereafter, something precious is lost and the bonding is short-circuited. The strongest marriages often occur where couples have walked slowly and deliberately through the progressive stages of physical intimacy, saving sexual consummation for the honeymoon. This concept is important for singles, but it also has something to say for married couples as well. Husbands and wives often make the mistake of rushing their intimacy or taking it for granted. But they also bond together best when they journey through the steps of intimacy regularly during their daily lives. Touching, talking, holding hands, gazing into one another's eyes, and building memories are as important to partners in their midlife years as to rambunctious 20-year-olds. So to lovers of all ages, I say, slow it down, make it last, take your time. To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org.